In 2002, I went on a seven-week summer mission trip to Ogden, Utah. At one point, I slept in the back of a vacuum shop, and I frequently took a bus down to Temple Square to do street evangelism. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know how to start conversations, and I didn't have anyone with me. I was a fumbling, bumbling fool. You probably would have cringed if you'd saw me. I still make people cringe, but. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have tracks, but I did have my Bible. One day at the South Gate, I came across a believer named Rob. He had a fanny pack <laughs> full of tracks, and he was speaking to a few young ladies. He explained the gospel to them, and he fielded some questions and objections. He asked if he could pray for them. He warned them and he beseeched them to follow Christ, to receive Christ, and then the conversation ended. It wasn't as clever as I had seen Ray Comfort do on evangelism VHS tapes. It wasn't dramatic by modern YouTube standards, and it did not require charisma, sorry Rob, or a quick wit, but it was imitable, approachable evangelism. I thought to myself, I can do that. I could realistically share the gospel of grace in conversation in a repeatable, peaceful way. There was something about watching Rob that opened a whole new world for me, and I was hooked. This is ironic to many of you because Rob is known as more of a John the Baptist street preacher now, but I met him in the context of gentle, conversational evangelism. Rob is versatile. Later that summer, I flew back to Ohio, and my then-girlfriend, I told my then-girlfriend, Stacy, that if we got married, I would move to Utah, that we would come to Utah, and I wanted to do evangelism for the rest of my life. In December of 2005, we moved to Orem, and I took a job as a computer programmer. I did some evangelism by speaking to students in front of high schools, and at skate parks. It's a good uh, option, by the way. The very untapped evangelism fishing hole. In 2007, we moved up to Salt Lake City, where I was able to start weekly evangelism at Temple Square in earnest. Sometimes Rob would join me, sometimes it was just me. Uh, one day, Paul Stoddart of the Rock Church visited my then church Lifeline community, and I invited Paul to join us. Soon we had three or four coming weekly, then five or six, then seven or eight, and we got into a rhythm. We'd show up on Thursday after work to intersect the tourists going to the tabernacle choir practice. We would first pray, and then we would hand out tracts and enter conversations. These were full nights. I have fond, uh, good, have good memories of sitting in a circle on the grass, sometimes until midnight, or even 1 a.m. with uh, Stacy calling, are you okay? <laughs> Speaking to curious unbelievers into ungodly hours of the morning. <laughs> we extended the night even more, praying by name for those we had spoken to, deeply thankful that the Lord had provided such conversations. And we kept coming back every Thursday. The bond of friendship between us believers grew. We were working together. We were celebrating and defending the gospel together. We were spending ourselves and pouring our hearts out for the lost. We were correcting and encouraging each other. As evangelists, by the way, we were sharpening each other. And we couldn't help but grow as partners in the gospel. The spiritual bonfire that we gathered around every week grew larger and hotter. And our love and our joy grew. Fast forward to 2022, continuations of the same group meet on Thursday nights near the Provo City Center Temple and at a busy corner at BYU's, near BYU's campus. We are breaking for winter and preparing for the next season, hence this conference. We want to gather with other evangelism-minded believers and encourage more bonfires, more friendships, more encouragement, and more joy. 
brothers, doing evangelism together multiplies our joy, and that joy, in turn, fuels our evangelism. Let me enumerate some ways that this happens. My wife always says, number your pages. (laughs) Our joy is not merely in the outcome or results of evangelism but in the very activity of of evangelism. There is pleasure in proclaiming the excellencies of Jesus Christ. That pleasure is independent of the response of the people we speak to. We preach Christ crucified, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, God in the flesh, King of kings, Lord of lords, image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation, creator of all things visible and invisible, born into the world as a baby. Does that ever stop you? God became a baby, concurring in two natures as the God-man, revealed as wisdom incarnate by his words, as Yahweh himself who controls nature by stilling the sea as the giver of life by raising Lazarus from the dead, forgiving sinners with all authority and sending terrified demons away with all authority, totally owning religious authorities who attempt to to trap him, confronting hypocrisy, fulfilling prophecy, restoring sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, mobility to the paralyzed, showing astounding grace to prostitutes, and tax collectors, and even to Peter, who denied him three times. Setting his face toward Jerusalem with resolve, praying for his enemies and caring for his mother on the cross, satisfying justice in totality by his own blood, resurrecting himself with Trinitarian unified action from the dead, ascending on high and giving gifts to his people, saving to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for his people. What a great Savior. There is pleasure in proclaiming the excellencies of Jesus Christ. And what a great gospel. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. There is pleasure in proclaiming this gospel. When it comes out of your own mouth, it goes back into your own ears. If you show up for evangelism grumpy from a bad day, tired from work, stressed by conflict in the home, discouraged, Discouraged by your own sin. Have you ever shown up on a Thursday night discouraged by your own sin? The gospel is life-giving. It reminds you of the forgiveness that you have in Christ. It reminds you of the glory of the Son of God. It reminds you of the true story of the gospel that far surpasses anything fictional, DC Comics, or especially Marvel, (laughs) or the Lord of the Rings, or Netflix, or anything Amazon Prime can give you. Boring! There is power in the blood, and there is pleasure in preaching Christ crucified. And there is encouragement in being reminded of the very gospel we preach. We have never shared the gospel together and regretted it. It has always only increased our joy, and our friendship has grown. Carpooling became a part of the, of the experience for us. Now we just meet at the church at, what, 6, 6.30? And we're, we're together. We're stuck in a car together. 
And it, it's just, we're just gluttons for more fellowship, more joy, more, more briefing, more socialization in between the evangelistic conversations. Now, there's, there is a kind of funny uh, social dynamic among evangelists. You're on the street, you're talking with each other, and bam, you could walk away, and there's somebody about to drop, you're like, go and buy them. There's a tract, you gotta get the tract out. So you, you, you just, you stop mid-sentence, and you just kind of get to, you just get used to it. I mean, like, you just <laughs> mid-sentence, somebody walks away. I, I do that anyway, I guess, but I, I mean, it's just, <laughs> that's where I got it from, maybe, I don't know. We have established camaraderie with believers from other churches. <sighs> the Rock, Corner Canyon, the Mission Church, Calvary Chapel, Salt Lake City, Jordan Valley Presbyterian, Fellowship Bible Church in Linden, Orchard, Hill, Orchard Hills Bible Church, South Mountain Community Church, the Refuge Church. It's hard to think of better ways to form the bond of friendships. <laughs> I really should have numbered these. <laughs> I really don't know what you're going to say. <laughs> in Christ, <laughs> with believers from other churches than to meet and do evangelism together. We have also matured in doctrine. We have spent hours debriefing on our, our interactions, recounting conversations, and learning from hard questions. We have been driven back to the scriptures over and over. It's so interesting. You can do evangelism for an hour one night, and it'll energize you to hit the treasure chest of scripture for weeks afterwards, for your own sake and for getting the jewels out and letting other people enjoy them as well. You can't hang out with evangelists and not talk doctrine. You can't become friends with evangelists and not grow in a love for theology. We have grown in our boldness. You ever feel like, I mean, even, to, even the boldest among us, you go out there again, for the first time in a while, and there's this thin sheet of ice you have to break through again. It's like the, it, 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 it freezes over, and you have to break through, you have to punch through the awkwardness and do it again, right? We have grown in our kindness. Some of us were very rough around the edges, when we, and sometimes we still devolve into that, of an unkindness or an exasperation. And being around brothers who are very kind, I mean, you, we catch so much uh, subconsciously just by being around those who speak the truth in love. We have learned to be thankful. We have a, a ritual as an evangelist <laughs> on Thursdays. We ask the Lord for one good conversation for each of us before the night's over, and the Lord lavishes us with way more than one typically. But we're easily pleased, which is a different way of saying we're easily thankful. It's important for evangelists to have a healthy criteria for satisfaction and joy. We go into the work of evangelism spring-loaded for joy, trigger-happy for joy. If I can hear the gospel come out of my own lips to an unwilling set of ears, win. Evangelists are easily pleased. You come home and your wife says, how did it go? And you can say, I got to share the gospel. I got to walk through the storyline of creation and fall and Israel and Exodus and the longing for the Messiah and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ by a virgin birth and his powerful words and works as though speaking not from here but from above of the great God-man, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross and busted out of the tomb with infinite power and ascended on high and offers forgiveness. He, do you really? This. Jesus, in, he offers all of himself immediately to anyone who would receive him. I got, to, I got to share that with someone, and I quite enjoyed it. And, added bonus maybe, they were good listeners, or it was received well, or it seems like they're thinking about it, or I think the Lord's doing something there. Our prayer has grown more fervent. We have felt our need for the Lord. We have prayed together that God would protect us from who? From our own flesh. And protect us from troublemakers who distract us and provoke us. Those are, uh, we have real thorns in the flesh. Do you realize that as, as an evangelist? Over the years, I've been doing this long enough to where Satan 
sins, seemingly, or God allows through sovereignty, use whatever verbs you want there, thorns in the flesh which distract us, which make us cringe and groan, and they distract us from doing effective evangelism. And we're praying, Lord, please keep them away. We pray that God would send just the right people to talk to us. We pray in precatory psalms for the destruction of false temples. We pray that God would grant repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, that he would draw yet more people to himself and make the fame of Jesus Christ yet more known in the Salt Lake and Utah valleys. We pray that our mouths would be open and that we would speak the word of truth and do so in love. <clears throat> we have developed a habit of singing together. We have learned to sing without a guitar and without any musically gifted persons among us. <laughs> <laughs> How fitting that we would finish a night of gospel proclamation and evangelism <laughs> with singing. Oh, it's such a natural overflow to get brothers together and sing and sing and pray and pray. It's just, it's just the cap. It's just, it's just what you do. It's the whole point of it all. It's weird when we don't do it. We had one night when we were at the, the new corner near BYU, and it was just a late night. It was a super late night, and we were just, oh, man, we're getting tired. We just got in our cars and left, and we were, like, texting later to each other. I'm really sorry. We didn't sing. We didn't pray. We didn't cap. It was just a weird night that we didn't cap it off that way. Our appreciation for greeting believers has grown. If you're talking all night long with polytheists and agnostics and atheists and cynics, and then you meet someone in town for a business convention who's a Baptist from Dallas, and by all accounts you can tell he's happy that you're there, he might say something like, man, it just feels spiritually oppressive and heavy around here, and I was just praying I'd run into someone who would share the gospel. I'm so glad you're here. I'll be praying for you. Where do you go to church? I go to such and such church. Well, it's, hear these words. It's good to meet a believer. Greetings, brother. You, you ever wonder about how we're supposed to obey those commands in the New Testament? Greet each other with a holy kiss. Greet the friends. The friends greet you, each by name. Grace and peace in Christ to you. I think we can obey that in some spirited way. Warm affection. Formal, familial, joyful greetings. Uh, way beyond per business casual, way beyond professional, way beyond casual. Oh, it's good to see a believer. Brother, good to meet you. Where do you go to church? We have learned more of the spiritual discipline of being excited to run into a believer and pray with them and greet them warmly. Our familiarity with our lost neighbors has grown. At Temple Square, we speak to agnostics with uh, progressives, with atheists, with Muslims, with Hindus, with traditional Mormons, with Jack Mormons, with agnostic Mormons, with transgender Mormons, with atheist Mormons, and postmodern Mormons, <laughs> <laughs> and BYU business college students, and University of Utah students, and temple visiting LDS couples, and very old Bruce McConkie fans, <laughs> wow. and visiting business professionals, and skiers, and tourists, and MLM conference attendees who would love to tell you about the oils they have. <laughs> and it's like, you, you share the gospel with them, and they're like, I have something to share, too. <laughs> it's like, it spiritualize the, uh, the, well, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Comic-Con attendees in full costume. Pokemon Go players in mass. <laughs> Fervent believers in false religion. Closet doubters. Uh, by the way, closet doubters at BYU who tell us they no longer believe a thing and they're just finishing out their degree. Closet doubters who reveal their struggles. Our love for the lost has grown. One of my favorite questions I've learned to use over the years is, have you ever, well, I'll start out with this. Uh, did you ever have any born-again Christian friends growing up? Did you go on a mission? Did you have any interesting interactions with born-again Christians or Baptists or Protestants? Did you ever have any interesting faith conversations? And then it kind of leads to this question of, have you ever heard a born-again Christian explain the gospel before? And if it's typical that to their memory, they have not. 
And it's such, an instru- it's such a helpful question to ask because either which way they answer, you have something to work with. If they say, yes, they have, they have heard it before, you can just say, well, what did they say? And you can build off of that, work with that, move with that. If they say no, which is often the case, you can stop in your heart and be provoked with compassion. This person, to their memory, in America, has never heard the gospel summarized before by a born-again Christian, at least to their memory. And so you can say, may I? It's so simple. It's almost formulaic at this point. It's just a great way to share the gospel. But it provokes your heart. These people don't know the gospel. They don't know it. It's not like they've examined all the is this distinct tenets of evangelical historic Christianity or Protestant Christianity and found them wanting. For the most part, they just don't understand most of what we teach. But there's also a hard-heartedness that I, does think, that I, do, th- that I do think provokes compassion. There's a, there's a strange supernatural spiritual dynamic where you'll have a very simple believer explaining a very simple gospel concept to a PhD academic who is not lacking for intellectual capacity, but cannot make sense of what this believer is saying. It has nothing to do with whether they're smart or not. It is spiritual. There's a veil. They can't see it. It's right there in front of them. And you're, well, well, but it, it provokes compassion. These people are blind. And as my friend Rob once said, you don't beat up blind people. <laughs> it's also so helpful for me to talk to common people on the street, especially here in Utah, common Mormon people. It's so easy to love the LDS people. They don't make it hard. It's very hard to love Mormon apologists. They can be some of the nastiest people that I've interacted with. They're very vicious and slanderous, not pleasant to work with. And it's so dangerous for me. It's it's such a temptation. You might see this with other long-time evangelists where they've, or sorry, uh, apologists, where they've done so much interaction with the worst characters that they harden their hearts and they stiffen up. It's so important for me to talk to normal, common people and to have my heart warmed. In 2 Timothy 2, Paul says that we ought not be quarrelsome, but we should teach and correct with long-suffering and patience. I'm paraphrasing here, but Paul says, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. And he says, these people have been ensnared by the devil. They're under a trap. They're spiritually enslaved to do the devil's will. Whoa! These people need God to grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. So there's a kind of at the edge of your seat optimism. God may perhaps grant this person repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. God might do it. Paul's use of terms is very interesting. God may perhaps grant them repentance. So you should teach and preach and correct with long-suffering and patience and kindness. God may perhaps grant them. So us evangelists, we're excited about that. We're optimistic about that. God loves Utah. He loves the people here. He's not done with them. He's so patient. He loves to save sinners. God loves to save sinners. Jesus loves Utah, and he loves to draw people to himself. All this stirs our hearts, and it moves us to love our neighbors, and it motivates us to keep at it. Hmm. So, befriending believers from other churches, joy. Hearing the gospel again and again, joy. Stirring each other up to the work of evangelism, joy. Energized to better know the scripture, joy. Learning more about our lost neighbors, joy. Proclaiming the excellencies of Jesus Christ, joy. Rehearsing and reviewing and repeating and reveling in the gospel of grace over and over and over again, joy, joy, joy. I like to say evangelism is less like seminary and more like Sunday school. You're saying the same basic things over and over again to a very simple people who don't need academic precision. They just need basic introduction. John Piper says, we aim that they share our joy and that we share theirs so that both joys are larger because of being shared. It is fitting that evangelists be a joyful people. 
Evangelism is fueled both by joy and an expectation of even more future joy. Do you remember the women who left the tomb? What did they do after they saw the risen Christ? They departed, quote, quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. Part of what motivated them to run is joy. Why do the apostles remind us of their eyewitness testimony of the risen Christ? Quote, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. John is a glutton for more joy. More joy. More joy. More mutually shared, growing, multiplied joy in the recounting of the eyewitness testimony of the risen Christ. Listen to King David after he participates in the adultery with Bathsheba and murder of Uriah. What does he ask for and why does he ask for it? He says in Psalm 51, Restore to me the what? The joy of my salvation and uphold me with the willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. And this guy just got done doing something that cost him the death of his firstborn son. And he says to God, please restore to me the joy of my salvation. I want to go tell people about how great you are. That applies to you, brothers. If David can pray that, you can pray that. After you've stumbled into awful sin, repent, make it right. And say to God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. I want to hit the streets again with my brothers with full joy. I want to tell people about you. What is Paul, how does Paul speak of those who are a fruit of his apostolic evangelism and church planning? Paul says of Philippians 4.1, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved, he calls them my joy and my crown. So talking here about an expectation of future increased joy. What will your converts be to you? My joy and my crown. Jesus says, well, he, he interacts with the woman at the well in John 4, and she runs with joy to tell people about the man who told her everything she ever did. And Jesus says to the disciples that came back, Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already one, the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. So that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Notice a few things. Jesus often ordains it such that the sower and the reaper are not the same person. That is a pattern in the growth of the kingdom. Typically, the person who reaps is not the person who sows. Typically, Christians are coming in, and they're building on the existing work that another, Christ, another set of Christians has laid you and I are building off the existing work that Christ has worked through previous generations of believers in Utah, who we have since long forgotten. We don't even know their names. We don't have much of a sense of history and continuity in Utah. We need more of that, of the John D. Nuttings, of the, is it the Robert Lamb, or uh, the guy who gave the lectures that impacted Sandra Tanner, who, of the Wally Topes, Anybody know Wally Tope? He died doing street evangelism. He's a brother worth getting to know. Of the countless church planners that came to Utah, even in the late 19th century, all the single Presbyterian women missionaries that came out to Utah, we don't know these people. And they served as schoolhouse teachers as a part of a missionary effort. Utah had no public schools prior to 1890. Did you know that? 
And there were hordes of Christians galvanizing money and people and prayer to send people to Utah, which was not yet a state. It was foreign missions among polygamous people who did not even have a schooling system. And so what was the main missionary strategy back then? Setting up Presbyterian and later Baptist schools. And these single women were coming out and they were going to rural Utah. And they had a special in with these rural communities to share the gospel in ways that these other men couldn't do. Wow! Wow! And all the church planters that have come to Utah, even the ones that have burned out, even the ones that had to leave, even the ones that didn't make it, they helped. They helped plant and sow seeds. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for previous generations of churches and evangelists. We follow in a venerable tradition of blessed believers. Where was I? Evangelism is fueled, again, both by joy and the expectation of even more future joy. So think about that phrase that Jesus said, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. Another observation. Jesus means for evangelism to end with a shared and mutual joy between those who have each invested differently into the kingdom of God's, to the growth of the kingdom. God means for evangelists someday to rejoice together with the people who disciple people, with the church planners, with the disciplers. You and I are meant to have a shared joy with who? Chiefly the people who are in the local churches we're sending people to. Paul says in Ephesians 4, he gave, Christ gave to the church, he gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. God means for evangelists to bless the local church. He means to use evangelists to equip the saints for the further work of ministry which will build up the church. But how? That's a question, brothers, that I submit we should camp on for the next year. Obviously, one reason, one way that God might equip the saints through evangelism is through adding saints to the household of God. It's pretty simple, right? Evangelists share the gospel, people get saved, and they, go, they, they join churches. This is something that God may choose to do, granting a person repentance that leads to a knowledge of the truth, and then leading that person to gather with the saints. What is the most appropriate place for believers to gather? I don't feel like I, I need to pound this hard in this room but maybe the recording is really important. Evangelists historically, I think, veered away from a healthy view of the local church. So this is important. What is the most appropriate place for believers to gather, to be incubated, to be discipled, to be shepherded, to be befriended? What is the most appropriate context for the exercise of the gifts, the spiritual gifts of believers? Where is the center of relational gravity meant to be for believers. It's not in evangelistic parachurch fellowships. As hot and awesome and warm and bonfire large that, is, that might be, as, as amazing as I love my, my brothers who do evangelism with me from other churches, as sweet as that is to me, the center of relational gravity and joy for me is the what? It's the local church, and I want other people to enjoy that. That's the whole point, brothers, in some sense here. Just think about it. When a, when a missionary agency sends out missionaries, what's the, what's the pattern? Well, you do entry, you do evangelism, you do discipleship, you do church planting, you set up a church that is self-governing, that financially can survive on its own, it's self-perpetuating, it has in turn evangelists who maintain a gospel witness in the area they're at, and then the, the missionary leaves and he does it again somewhere else. And that's what we are, brothers. We're the evangelists who maintain a gospel witness, a proclamation of the gospel in Utah, extending the work of the local church. Oh, Aaron, you gotta put some... some <clears throat> sorry. Mm. Our aim as evangelists is to share the gospel and point people to local churches. Not to be an annoyance to local churches, but to be a blessing to them. We want to bless the pastors 
of our local churches. We want to have good rapport with them. We want to know who they are. Brothers, do we even know the local churches that are available to the people we're witnessing to? I challenge you, brothers, this year to know a half dozen churches that you can, in good conscience, point people to. We want to know what's available. We want to do follow-up. We want to invite. <clears throat> brothers, let me end with this major point here. Your evangelism has a long-term, downstream, encouraging effect on your local church. So now we're revisiting that text. Jesus, Paul says, God gave, Christ gave, among others, evangelists to bless, to equip the local, to, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to build up the local church eventually. So how is God using evangelists like you and me to bless the local church? That's the big question. And I'm telling you, my thesis is, God has designed evangelism and evangelists to the long-term, downstream, encouraging effect on the local church. But how? A couple ways. One, if you establish a stable and regular evangelistic pattern and presence, the pastors of your churches will be happy to send believers your way. Hey, uh, brother, I just met another person in the church who says they have an itch to scratch. They want to learn how to do evangelism, and I'm thinking they, I could send them your way, and I trust you. We, t we take people who are new to evangelism, who might not even develop a big habit out of it, but they want, they want to experience it so they could come and they can shadow, and they can be blessed by that. Another way that evangelists and evangelism blesses the local church is through reports. And I, you can see this precedented in the book of Acts. What is the book of Acts other than a set of glory stories of how God worked to grow the church through the Holy Spirit? God loves to use your reports, brothers, and your stories of your evangelistic encounters. He loves it. He loves to use your stories, your, your practical evangelistic stories of what just happened this week or yesterday to bless the believers in your local church. Even the hard stories. This is tremendously encouraging on the local church. For one, it focuses people on the gospel. There are battles worth fighting over doctrine and culture and ethics, but evangelism helps you crystallize your focus on the gospel. By doing this, it helps you live in Christian community with others who have very different viewpoints than you on certain points of theology. Evangelism helps me have chummy camaraderie and sweet fellowship with stodgy Presbyterians, very loud charismatics. I mean, we, we have been on the street before praying together, and we look around and we think the churches we're from are very different. We're very different. We, we've had Anthony with us. Uh, uh, he would end the, pray the group prayer by shouting uh, declarations that Christ would come and conquer the demons that are among us. And, <laughs> and we're all sitting here like, but he, total brother, total genuine, totally genuine, loved having him there. Bring it, brother, bring it. We have had brothers that are, are, are quiet, spirited, and um, who have just have a different style of doing things than us. We've had brothers that are very ardent, principled Arminians, ardent, principled Calvinists. On the street, sharing the gospel, we work together and we do so with joy. And we bring that kind of spiritual unity back into the church. What I mean by that is, in your local church, you have differences between brothers. And your evangelism crystallizes a focus on the gospel, which brings unity to the church. It blesses the local believers. This unified focus of evangelists is a blessing on the local church. This also emboldens your brothers and encourages your sisters. Evangelism requires a kind of backbone. It emboldens you. You have to straighten up your spine. Evangelism can be costly to your reputation. People we speak to on the street want to bring up hot button cultural topics. I just talked to an atheist a month or two ago who, who said, I just have one question for you. What do you think about same-sex marriage? And it was like, the pivotal question, the answer to which decided whether he would talk to me or not. And I told him I had a traditional sexual ethic, and I, I uh, believed the Bible when it talked about marriage and sexuality, and he walked, he abruptly walked away before my sentence even finished. 
Brothers, we, we have to learn to be bold on the street to speak faithfully to such issues. And that's, that straightens up your spine. It forces you to exercise courage and boldness, even just beyond starting religious conversations with strangers on the street. <laughs> that requires a kind of boldness. This matures men into being bold soldiers. It has a downstream edifying effect on the local body. And like I mentioned earlier, it has a downstream effect on the local church by influencing believers to have a love for doctrine. Like I said earlier, you can't get a dozen guys together for evangelism without eventually enjoying theology together. And finally, it trains believers to share and articulate the gospel in a simple and accessible way to, to, to unbelievers. This is really simple. When you share the gospel a hundred times, it helps, doesn't it? You start practicing different and more clear ways to explain the gospel to people. This has a, an effect on your local church. This helps you explain the gospel in your local church. Because you realize, don't you, that sometimes people in the local church, they need to hear the gospel over and over and over again. And sometimes your visitors need to hear the gospel. I'll end with a story uh, with, of Lee Miller, who could not be here. And I remember sitting on the chair in the lobby. Um, this is a common occurrence, actually, but I just remember a couple weeks ago, sitting on the chair and looking out at the lobby, and Lee Miller was kindly explaining the gospel to a relatively new visitor with his deep and clear and kind voice, with his hands and his look of concern and his gentleness, he was sharing the gospel with a visitor at the local church very kindly. Lee, where did Lee get that from? Lee has spent years now on the street, and we love, if you're, if you're ever discouraged, come on a Thursday night and just shadow Lee Miller. Just listen to him share the gospel with someone. That man loves the gospel. So brothers, let us be refreshed this winter. Let us prepare for joy-multiplying spring evangelism that shares the gospel of grace and blesses your local churches. I encourage you to exchange contact information with each other and uh, increase the bond of friendship and fellowship between those who love to do evangelism.